I'm in pursuit of Paul, the Apostle. My name is Con Campbell. I've studied Paul's 13 New Testament letters for years. Now I want to know him better. For the first time, I'm following his journeys from Jerusalem across the Mediterranean, all the way to Rome, where he was martyred. Leaving the southern coast of Turkey, I headed toward a little-known, small Greek island. In the first century, the people groups living around the Mediterranean Sea hadn't even heard of the name of Jesus. Yet the Apostle Paul boldly entered the rough waters of this pagan Roman world to persuade them to abandon the ship of all they had believed. I'm on the island of Gasolorizo, also known as Megisti. It's the easternmost part of Greece, just off the coast of Turkey. The local tradition of the island is that Paul visited here at one point in his travels. But the real reason I'm here is because of my connection to this island. My mother's family comes from this island, making my heritage half Greek. Restaurants and cafes line the harbour with Mediterranean colours. This home has been in our family for generations. Photographs of my relatives hang on the walls. Other reminders display the heritage of this place. My uncle lovingly restored the house, preserving its character. It's a joy for me to be here and to have such a connection to this part of the world, a region in which Paul was so active. The island actually celebrates the impact that the message of Paul would have on the Roman Empire. Today is St. Constantine and Helen's Day, Constantinos Ke Eleni. Constantine was the Roman emperor who converted to Christianity, and there is a Greek Orthodox celebration here on Gusto Lorizo. There's a procession moving down the street from one church down to another church. This horn is in celebration too of the parade. And the whole island will stop and watch as it goes by. You know, as I think about Constantine, I'm struck by an irony. Years after Paul's first missionary journey, he would sail by here once again on his way to Rome as a prisoner of Rome. And he would be in captivity in Rome and eventually he would die in Rome for the message that he preached. And the irony is that a couple of hundred years later, Constantine, the emperor of Rome, converted to Christianity. So it's true to say that the Roman Empire put Paul to death for the message that he preached, only later to be conquered by that same message. But before the message of good news about Jesus would ascend to the heights of Roman rulers, there would be many years of sacrifice by the Apostle Paul and others like him. We have a great view of the village down below, but more importantly, we have this view of the stretch of the coast of Turkey. That's Turkey right there, so close to this island. And we know that Paul passed through here at least twice. So I like to think that, you know, maybe 2,000 years ago, one of my ancestors might have stood right here. And who knows, maybe at the right time, have seen Paul's boat go by. About 200 miles to the southeast of the island, Paul began his first missionary journey in Cyprus. The place I began tracking Paul's strategic contact with the Roman world lies about 200 miles to the southeast of our family's island. 
To help me experience what it was like for Paul to sail in the Mediterranean waters, I met with Dr. Linford Stutzman. Linford. You must be Khan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Every summer he takes student study tours to ports and places where Paul had been. I like the name of his boat, which he calls Sailing Acts, because the book of Acts maps the point on Paul's journeys in detail. Thanks, Linford, for having me on your sailboat. This is a real treat. What do you think it was like for Paul to spend so much time at sea at the Mediterranean? Was that smooth sailing like this, or what was it like? Well, if you read the New Testament, if you read Acts, you can see it wasn't always smooth sailing. Uh -huh, yeah. And indeed, the Mediterranean is one of the trickier bodies of water because it's so changeable so quickly. And with square rig sails, you're kind of at the mercy of good winds. So Paul spent a lot of time waiting for good wind. If you look around, you see these inlets and islands and wind can speed up and do tricky things when forced into these channels. So that's, that's tricky enough, but to do that without charts, mm -hmm. without navigating instruments, is, is, is amazing. It's 14 years since Saul the Pharisee met Jesus on the road to Damascus. In those 14 years after becoming a follower of Jesus, Paul had gained experience teaching and preaching to both Jewish and non-Jewish people. Paul was now prepared for a greater work and mission that God was calling him to do. So Paul and Barnabas were set off by the church in Antioch on their first missionary journey. Round about AD 46, they set sail on the Mediterranean with their helper John Mark. And their first stop, Cyprus. Along the eastern shoreline of the island of Cyprus, the seawall of the ancient harbour still tries to hold back the waves from the Roman port city of Salamis, where Paul landed. Barnabas was a native of Cyprus. This was his homeland. He had family and friends here, so it was familiar to him at least. And he no doubt wanted his friends and family, his countrymen, to hear the good news about Jesus' death and resurrection. But even here, a familiar place, we see that very quickly the missionaries encounter some pretty strong opposition, something that is going to characterize all of Paul's missionary activity from this point. I love just being here and imagining Paul and Barnabas and their traveling companion, John Mark, arriving by boat into this harbor as they embark on their very first missionary journey to preach the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles. Salamis was a Roman city on Cyprus extending for a mile along the coast. Acres of ruins remain. It's important to realize that at the time of Paul's first missionary journey, there are really no known churches west of the eastern bank of the Mediterranean. There are no churches in Asia Minor, there are no churches in Europe. So Paul is really breaking new ground by traveling to Cyprus. And even though there are no churches, there are many Jewish synagogues scattered throughout the empire. And the first place that Paul presents the message of Jesus on this journey to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, is in the synagogues of Salamis in Cyprus. No ancient synagogues have been found here so far, but what remains is the gathering place for the Gentile community, which was the theater that seated 15,000 people before it was reduced in size by an earthquake. It's striking that the first stop in Paul's missionary journey to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, is actually to the Jewish synagogue. And in fact, this becomes the pattern that Paul follows throughout all his journeys. He always goes to the synagogue first with every new place, the synagogue first, and then he goes to the Gentiles. So why does he follow that pattern? Well, I think there are at least two reasons. There's a theological reason and a pragmatic reason. 
The theological reason is that Paul understands that his message is primarily, or at least in the first instance, a message for the Jewish people. That Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He's the King of the Jews. Paul understands that they ought to have the privilege first of hearing this message about Jesus before it goes to everyone else, to the Gentiles and around the world. That's the theological reason. The practical reason is that the synagogues are scattered throughout the Roman Empire and they become hubs for Paul's missionary activity. He goes there, he speaks about Jesus, and uh, many Jews respond with joy and, and, and with belief and they, they accept that Jesus is the Messiah. And so they become the natural leaders and elders of the churches that quickly become formed throughout Asia Minor. These people already know the Hebrew Bible, the scriptures. They already understand the promises of God to the Jewish people. So they are well equipped to accept this message about Jesus and to share it with others. And that, I think, really explains why Paul goes to the synagogue first and then to the Gentiles. And we see that happen for the first time here in Salamis. Paul will spend his life walking Roman roads just like this one throughout the empire, sharing his message about Jesus with the Gentiles. According to the New Testament book, The Acts of the Apostles, it's here in Cyprus that Saul is first referred to as Paul. Now, most Jews would have had two names, a Hebrew name, Saul, and a Roman name, Paul. But the question is, why here in Cyprus, why now is he being referred to as Paul? And from thenceforth, he is only known as Paul. Well, there are two possible reasons. A minor reason could be that Paul is endearing himself to the Roman proconsul Sergius Paulus. But a major reason would be that now on his first missionary journey to the Gentiles, he is using his Roman name because now he is the apostle to the Gentiles. Nearby, the monastery of St. Barnabas was built to honor him as the patron saint of Cyprus. The visit reminded me of the sacrifice that many early followers of Jesus would make. There is simplicity to the space. The mood calls for reflection and reverence. Icon paintings identify ancient followers of Jesus. This is Barnabas. Here in Greek it's written, Η εκκλησία της Κύπρου ιδρύθη υπό δύο αποστόλων του Παύλου και του Βανάρβα και του Ευαγγελίστου Μάρκου which translated says the Church of Cyprus was founded by the two apostles Paul and Barnabas and the evangelist Mark, which is of course referring to Paul's first missionary journey. Paul did not ever return to Cyprus, but Barnabas did return with his cousin John Mark. And according to tradition, Barnabas was martyred in AD 61. He was killed for preaching in Jesus' name. After Salamis, Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark traveled the whole island of Cyprus and ended up in a town called Paphos on the southwest corner of the island. Their presence did not go unnoticed as the Roman proconsul Sergius Paulus, who was in charge of the entire island, requested an audience with Paul. He wanted to hear what Paul had to say. But in his company was a sorcerer by the name of Elimas, who strongly opposed Paul's message. And this created a conflict with Paul, so that Paul called Elimas a child of the devil, and then evidently put some kind of curse on him so that he was temporarily blinded. And this is the first miracle that is attributed to Paul. Sergius Paulus was impressed by Paul's display of power over his sorcerer, but he was also impressed by Paul's teaching so much so that he decided to become a follower of Jesus himself. And this is the first recorded convert in Paul's first missionary journey. 
And it's very significant that Sergius Paulus is this first convert because not only is he a Gentile, a non-Jew, but he is a Roman and not only a Roman, but a Roman proconsul under the authority of the Roman Senate. And this is a sign of things to come. Paul, Barnabas and John Mark could not have fully known just how imposing the rest of their journey and mission would be. In an effort to move deeper into the Roman Empire on their first missionary outreach, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark sailed north from Cyprus toward the region of Asia Minor to what is today the southern coast of Turkey. The first sight of land must have got their attention. They were entering the region of the Taurus Mountains. These mountain barriers to the interior added to the challenges they would face in carrying the story of Jesus forward. After reaching shore, they entered the city of Perga. There I connected with Dr. Mark Fairchild, a professor and author who's explored this region for years. So, Mark, we're at the uh, ancient city of Perga. What can you tell me about this city? The city was originally a Greek city. Okay. Uh, it dates back to at least the fourth century BC. Uh -huh. uh, later, it was overlaid with Roman construction. So the street that we're entering, it's called the Cardo Maximus, the main boulevard, it's a beautiful street, had a fountain flowing down the center. Then you have shops lining, colonnades on both sides, would have been beautiful. And you can imagine the site, Paul, Barnabas and John Mark coming into this must have been awed and amazed by the artwork that they saw as they entered. So John Mark splits here because of the intimidating journey ahead of them, right? Uh, no doubt. If you look off into the distance, you can see very precipitous mountains. Yeah. And it gets worse from here. These are just the foothills right now, but uh -huh. it gets much worse. They networked with the Jewish community, and of course they know what lies ahead. And it's at that point that they realize that they have not only the dangers of the mountain crossing, but they also have the dangers of, of uh, going without food, without shelter, yeah. and also the dangers of, uh, of thieves. Right, so John Mark said, John Mark see said, you guys, I'm out of here. Yeah, says, yeah. This, is, this wasn't a part of the bargain. Right. This wasn't a part of the deal. Following one of Paul's possible routes north, I headed from Perga toward the city of Pisidian Antioch in the heart of the region of Galatia. In the fall of AD 46, Paul and Barnabas travel north through the mountains. The rugged terrain is expansive and beautiful. I had an opportunity to walk on one of the Roman roads that Paul may have traveled. G'day. I went there with Dr. Mark Wilson and his tour group. Virtually no remains of the road. Mark lives in Turkey. He teaches and is the author of a guidebook of biblical sites in Turkey. On the Roman road, Mark told me about some of the more significant things to look for while tracing Paul's journey. Well, the Romans on the roads, they erected milestones to let travelers know precisely where they were at. Yeah. Paul and Barnabas coming through this pass would have seen this Augustan milestone, uh, dates from 6 BC. Uh -huh. And very faintly on the bottom, you can see in Roman numerals, the mileage 139 Roman miles from this point to Pisidian Antioch. Right. So uh, Paul and Barnabas would have known precisely uh, how far they had how to go from here. Go. When you read a book of Acts, uh, Luke says they went from here to there, but when you actually get out on a Roman road like this, and you uh -huh. can see uh -huh. the type of scenery, the landscape, it really brings it to life, the, yeah. the type of experience they had in yeah. traveling from city to city during their journeys. Seeing this ancient road snake out across the landscape, I kept thinking about Paul's determination to make Jesus known no matter what and the treacherous roads he traveled would be just one of the physical challenges he would encounter. Standing over 3,000 feet, or more than 1,000 meters in elevation, the city of Pisidian Antioch finally emerged on the landscape. A theater remains, but is overgrown and silent. Straight stone streets form the main arteries of this once vibrant city. At the highest point of the city, a temple was built to honor Augustus and would be used for emperor worship. The symbol of authority stood like a spiritual mountain range to be crossed. I was reminded of the dominance of pagan beliefs 
with a worldview that offered little real hope in this life or the life to come. These are the ruins of a fourth century church known as St. Paul's Church. And the reason it's called that is that many believe it's built on the foundations of an original synagogue, the very synagogue where Paul first preached when he arrived in Pisidian Antioch. When Paul spoke in the synagogue, he drew on the shared history of Israel with his hearers and the shared knowledge of the Hebrew Bible, the scriptures. And he wanted to show that his message about Jesus is in continuity with their history and with the scriptures. He is the one they have been waiting for. Now, Paul's message was received well, and he was invited to come back the following Sabbath to speak again about this Jesus in the synagogue. But by that time, the whole town had heard about Paul and Barnabas, and they all came to the synagogue to hear him speak, including the Gentiles. And it was at that point that some of the Jews became jealous of the attention and the popularity that Paul and Barnabas were gathering and they made things difficult for them. So it was at that point that Paul said, well, now we turn to the Gentiles. And more Gentiles did believe in the nearby city of Lystra when Paul healed a man who had been unable to walk since birth. Some Jews came to Lystra from Antioch and Iconium, and they were well acquainted with Paul and Paul's message, and they were strongly opposed to him. And their opposition led to them stoning Paul, taking rocks like this and beating them against his body. Paul must have got quite a beating because they thought he was dead and they dragged him outside the city and left him there. But Paul was not dead and he picked himself up, dusted himself off and went back into town. The next day, Paul and Barnabas left Lystra for the near nearby town of Derby. This was the first time that Paul was stoned for preaching Christ, but it would not be the last. And I think that this event must have reminded Paul of another stoning some 15 years earlier, a stoning that he participated in, but not as the victim, rather as one of the perpetrators. The stoning of Stephen was where Paul's story begins. The young man named Saul giving approval to Stephen's death. And it must have occurred to Paul that now the tables have fully turned. He is being stoned just like Stephen for preaching the message of Christ. Later, Paul wrote a letter back to both the Jewish and Gentile believers in the region, expressing his confidence in Christ. He said in the letter, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This was Paul's earliest letter, and he was concerned that they had changed what he had taught about how to be right with God, because most people think it's something we have to achieve. For me, this was a very important letter, an important message as a new Christian in my early 20s. Because when you come to terms with the fact that you may have been living your life in rebellion against God, ignoring Him or rejecting Him or pushing Him away or whatever it might be, then comes the inevitable question, how do I know that I'm right with God? What do I need to do? Do I need to fix things? Do I need to get things right? Do I need to perform these good deeds? What must I do to be right with God? And the answer is found in the letter. We are justified by faith. And so with that idea comes great freedom for the Christian because we realize that it's not dependent on our performance. It is dependent on what Christ has done and all that we need to do is gladly receive accept and believe in what he has accomplished. When you think about it, we're not being asked to row our way across the Mediterranean. That's almost impossible. We're simply asked to set our sails to believe that what Jesus did for us will carry us all the way home. 